Dave Finney and others about six months of gentle persuasion and encouragement to get me 100 feet <laughs> from there to here. But what you need to know is it's taken God 16 years. Wow. 16 years to get to this point. You know, I'm not very sociable. I don't like talking to people. You know, my safe place in this building is the kitchen. And if I'm not in the kitchen, I'm stood at the back. That's where I am safe. So, I'm just going to tell you, 16 years. But if I do it in less than 22 years, it'll have taken me less time to achieve what God set out for me than what it took the Israelites to get to the promised land. So, <laughs> I'm on track. <laughs> right. Please bear with me, because I'll probably get a little bit tongue-tied, a little bit lost, and who knows where it's going to go. But I've got my words in front of me, don't worry. There's a lot of words, but it's in big print. <laughs> right. So, a few weeks ago, Ant opened up the service, and he, and he opened up with Genesis, and I'd like to take us back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, And then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be free, fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature and fruit seed bearing plant. Then God said, I give every seed and every tree. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and there was the sixth day. Let me tell you, we are not an afterthought. We didn't appear because of evolution. Everything that we have is a consequence of God loving us. Even before we were created, he put everything in place. Everything was put on this earth so we could inhabit this earth. Right, so let me share something with you, and I realise this. We humans on the earth, I'd say that day seven was the last time God got a rest. So if you think you've got a bad work-life balance, you should try this one. Right. It is God's extravagance that we're here. He provided everything. And the reason for that is relationship. Scientists and evolutionists will try and convince you that humans' procreation is for the survival of the species, self-preservation, and that we must keep the species going. But Genesis 1 says, let us make mankind in our image. But it also says, let us make mankind in our likeness. So therefore that reveals that it's not only his image, but his desires, his dreams, his thoughts, and his emotions were placed into us when he created us. So the desire for us to join together, to come together, to have children, to have a relationship with our children, is not about evolution. It's about God passing on his desire to have a relationship with his children so we can pass that relationship on to our children. Right. And what I hope to share with you this morning is that we, and it is only us, that limit the amount of relationship that we have with Jesus and we have with God, right? That we can intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously choose the level of relationship. And by us choosing because of the free will that God gave us, right, we either stop the access 
or allow the access that God so freely wants. So I'm going to share with you, I'm not going to go into great detail about what caused it, but I'm going to share something very personal to you. That is the start of the 16 years. Okay, so in 2006, unfortunately, saw the breakdown of my first marriage. And I ended up having a nervous breakdown. And unfortunately, for those that have suffered, for those that suffer, you will know. But it's debilitating. It freezes you. I didn't work. And for those that know me, working, not being able to work made it even worse. I, I literally went to bed for a year. And there were times when I didn't have the strength, right, because it drains you absolutely. I didn't even have the strength to take my head off the pillar, right? I wouldn't shower for days. I wouldn't shave for days. I would just... And the thing is, is the more you do nothing, the more you think about it, and the more you put yourself into that depression. It's self-feeding. So if you are debilitated by the illness, you actually feed that illness by your thoughts and your actions. And... It's frightening. So, eventually I was able to uh, access mental health and I was able to access a mental health team. But I remember a good day and I, re I remember I made the decision that I'd go out uh, for a ride on my bike and I ended up at one of the reservoirs at the top of Old Moss. And I decided to have a chat with God. Well, actually, I grunted at him for quite a while about the situation. And it's always the same grunt. Oh, you're supposed to be my healer, so why aren't I healed? Why am I feeling like this? And God informed me, I've given you a toolbox. Open it and use it. Huh. What sort of answer is that? Because <laughs> our thought pattern is, I want healing now. I want that healing now. Right? Well, it doesn't always happen like that. And you have to work your way through the toolbox. So, the toolbox. The toolbox is individual. It is individual to every person, and it is individual to every situation, but does contain all the essentials for every single one of us for the problem or the situation that we are currently in. Because when we face a problem later down the line, he will place new tools in that toolbox for that situation. Okay, but there are some staples. It's a bit like your grocery cupboard. We have tins of tomatoes and we have tins of beans. But there are staples in the toolbox. Number one is the Bible. And Proverbs 8.33 says, Listen to my instruction and be wise and don't disregard it. Well, that answers that. Full stop. Listen to my instruction, be wise and don't disregard it. That's a very simple, very simple rule. And if he, he tells you there, please follow me rule. The second is prayer. Philipp Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Thanks. <laughs> right? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present, present your request to God. And as a consequence, may the peace of God that defies all understanding, it will go with you. So if you are in a situation, spend some time with God. Pray. Right? And by faith, understand that your prayer will be answered. Yeah. Number three, and I've learned so much looking at this, is forgiveness. Ephesians 1 7. In him we have redemption through his blood through the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Yeah. Forgiveness is a major tool, and there are two forms of forgiveness. The first form of forgiveness is a horizontal form, where you ask God to forgive somebody on your behalf. The second form is a vertical form, where you ask God to forgive yourself. Right? Now, I didn't know this, but it is biblically impossible to forgive yourself but it is absolutely biblical to accept that you are forgiven through Christ Jesus yeah, and that the grace of God and so when we have given something to God right for our forgiveness and he has forgiven us it's done 
full stop. It's done. The problem is our mind reminds us of our past and then we start to feel unworthy, we feel condemnation, we feel guilt and we feel low self-esteem. And being human, we allow this to build and build. And it builds like a snowball and then it leads to anxiety. But by receiving our forgiveness and accepting that we are forgiven, we can move forward and accept all that God has for us. Yeah. I read an article and I decided to put it in this. It stated that it takes something new to become routine or a habit between 59 and 70 days. So, if you've suffered from anxiety and low self-esteem and mental illness and everything else that we suffer as humans, right? Just imagine how far you could come if you convinced yourself or told yourself, right, that God's got this, God's in control, you are forgiven. I've been suffering for 16 years, but yet that article told me within 59 or 70 days, I could have a new routine. So please, change the mindset. God has got this. He's in control. One of the other tools in the toolbox is peace. Philippians 4, 6, same one again. Do not be anxious, right, about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And when the peace of God that trans all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, can I share something with you? I hear Philippians 4, verse 7, every day. Every time I go to work, every time I'm at a funeral, part of the service is always, and with the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Right? And 99% of the people that are there haven't got a clue. Haven't got a clue. We do. We understand what it is to have God's peace. We understand the sacrifice that was made so that God could grant us that peace. So search for it, find it, and use it. It's a tool. Right. So one of the other tools, and this is where our tools become individual to ourselves, is outside help. Right. I was fortunate enough to be able to access counsellors, therapists, clinical psychologist, right? And with their help, we were able to go forward. I have conversations with Christians in this room, and they've said, well, you know, you're supposed to rely on God. I don't know if I should accept outside help. I don't know if I should do that because we're supposed to rely on God. Well, let me just tell you what the Bible says. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. This means that even if people on this earth do not believe in God, do not have a relationship with God, they are gods. And the gifts they have are God-given. So if they are mental health therapists, if they are financial advisors, if they are any situation where we need help, we can access these people because it is God-given. The help is there. By relying on God, use the people that is provided, right, and f- use the tools that's in the toolbox. Right. At the beginning of the year, when we were discussing the prayer book, right, and we watched the video, in the video, the man talked about the toolbox, So after the service, I spoke with John Ledgway and how God had informed me that some years earlier about the use of the toolbox, John commented, this is something he believed that the church needed to hear. And would I be prepared to do the testimony? My answer was, I'll tell you, you can tell them. (laughs) Right? To which he said, it doesn't work like that. And yet again, I said, I'll tell you and you can tell them. Over the next few months, John asked me if I would be prepared to speak on the subject, and eventually, at the beginning of June, I agreed. The following Sunday, 
Right? When I saw John, I said to him, I've come up with another idea. I said, if you give me a microphone and I stand at the back of church, <laughs> 100 foot away, right, in my comfort zone, and get everybody to look forward, I'd be prepared to do that. And yet again, he told me, don't work like that. Don't work like that at all, John. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Right? And what I've come to realise from being asked, agreeing, and then being here this morning is that even as a funeral director, God is showing me that I can achieve. Yeah. Right. But it's baby steps. Yeah. It's baby steps. And it's about how far you are willing to open to allow that relationship in that defines how big your steps are and how fast you will get to where he needs you to go. Yeah. Right? God truly answers prayers. But you have to be prepared to do the hard work. Yeah. You know, God will give you his relationship, but you have to build that relationship. And believe me, you will be pushed beyond your comfort zone. And you will definitely be removed from your safe place. Can I have that thing up, please? You know, I love that picture. I have a full copy of that picture on my living room wall. And it's been there for 20 odd years. Uh, and it's called Light of the World. And it's probably one of the most famous pictures de uh, depicting Christ. The artist, John Ullman Hunt, painted the picture after he believed he received divine instruction from God. And it's an interpretation from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you open, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. We will share a meal together as friends. The door in the painting has no handle and therefore can only be opened from the other side right. representing the shut mind yeah. our mind closed the decision is ours we can choose to open the door allow God in allow him to help us reach our full fulfilment right? and we can keep the door closed and we can remain in this world right But, Revelation 20 is only part of it. See, people have believed for years that this picture and Revelation 3.20 is the ability for non-believers to come into relationship with Christ. Right? It has always been seen It is actually part of a letter. And it is a letter that John... How are we pronouncing it? Right. It is actually part of a, a letter that John wrote to the church at Laodicea. Right? And it says this, and it starts from chapter 15. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot or cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm warm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realise that you are wretched and miserable and poor. I'm blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, so you will be not shamed by your nakedness, an ointment for your eyes, so they will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be indulgent and turn from your indifference. So Revelation 3.20 is not about opening the door to new Christians. 
It's not about opening the door for people that don't have a relationship. It's about people that have already accepted Jesus, opening that door so that he can come in because we keep that door closed. Yeah. Right? And then in verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock. Now that's quite, really when you think about it, it's quite sad that as believers in Christ and we say every Sunday morning that we know Jesus and we know the sacrifice that he's made for us, but yet he knocks at the door and we don't let him in. Right? Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Right? Verse 21. I love this. Those who are victorious will sit with me on the throne. Just as I was victorious and sat with my father on the throne. Now, I'm going to open my hands up here and say I might have read Revelation once. It's a little bit like thick clay you look you read your bible and you get to revelation and you get another day and you go back to genesis right i don't want to go there i get confused you know it just so i've never read that in that context i might have browsed through it reading it very quickly but i've never read it in that context those who are victorious will sit with me on the throne just as i was victorious and sat with my father on the throne that has to be the greatest goal. Yeah. Right? That's, to me, that's just, that's everything we should be aiming for. Absolutely. You know, forget Britain's Got Talent, or <laughs> Pop Idol, if you're as old as I am. But that's the goal. Yeah. To have such a relationship with Jesus that we can sit at his side as he sat at his father's side. Yeah. And the thing being is, from Genesis, as we've shown, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation, 64 books in between, the greatest prize is the relationship. It's the relationship that we have individually and corporately, but mainly individually. I know that my journey's still got to continue. You know, I still suffer from mental health issues. There are days when I just probably unbearable you'd have to ask Jane right but the prize is I know God's got my back yeah. I know he's on the case yeah. you know we uh, we sing a song and I can't remember the name of the song it's gone now but it says even when we're not looking he's working yeah. even yeah. when we're not listening he's working yeah. in the background he constantly works yeah, yeah. But you don't see the works being done if you don't open the door. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I just encourage you, please, just encourage you, just build that relationship. Yeah. Right? 16 years. Now, it's taken so long because after I'd finished working with the mental health team, I was diagnosed with anxiety disorder and social awareness orders which means I don't actually like talking to people I'm miserable <laughs> right and considering where I was not getting my head off the pillow and getting out of bed and washing and looking after myself I actually accepted that that'll do I can live with that I'm getting out of bed I'm going to work this is the thing that is not where God stopped that's where I stopped because I accepted second best. I said to myself, I can live with this situation compared to where I was. It's quite easy. Go to work, you know, don't have to talk to people. That's not a big thing, is it, really? Don't have to be happy, you know? The joys of being a funeral director. You don't talk to a lot of people. <laughs> and you don't get the customer complaints. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, don't accept second best for yourself if you allow God in and you allow God to open the door and allow him in he will see you through to the end Absolutely.